Jesus feed me. Good evening, everybody. Oh. Um, so this presentation has been a journey. Uh, it began at NARAM 51. Who is at NARAM 51? Okay. Um, who remembers uh, this? So this had a big impact on me because my good friend Chan Stevens, uh, I was helping him uh, prep, and he was using electronics, and he was very, very, very nervous about whether it would work or not. And unfortunately, the electronics didn't e electronic, and uh, this was the result, and it cost him dearly. And he was, you know, obviously very upset about that. And at the time, I'm like, I was thinking because my kids were just starting to fly. Uh, Alyssa was starting to fly RC. I'm like, why not just use RC? And it's in the back of my head. Um, and then last year, I was thinking, okay, maybe next year I'm going to compete. So what, what should I do for RD? Um, maybe I'll go back and, and do that because I don't see people using. Uh, RC in traditional rocketry. It's in uh, the radio control gliders, but not in traditional rocketry. And so I tried hooking up a, so I just, I just hooked in a glider up to the, the gear switch and nothing happened. So, okay, this is going to be a bigger project than I thought. Um, and so if you could take me to the next slide. So the objective of the, uh, of the, um, of the project was to determine if RC can be, modern RC can be reliably used in traditional rocketry. And I, I know it can be in, a, in high power, but I really wanted to focus on mid power and low power. Um, and uh, high power, you can just load it up with all sorts of extra antennas and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and, and for two things in particular, mid stage or air starting, uh, uh, mid -air, uh, ignition or staging, and then also for human control, um, uh, ejection, which could be obviously uh, in some of the events in the room here, it could be very beneficial if you control the ejection right at Apache, or maybe you want to come down a little bit to help get a recovery. There's a number of applications for uh, for this. Uh, next slide, please. So, gap staging, huge challenges as you all know. There's a limit to how far it can go, and the reliability goes down the further you go. A lot of people get really nervous about you doing that. Uh, this could be an application there. Delay staging, what if you wanted it to, the first stage to coast for a while, uh, and then ignite. Uh, there could be mission points there for scale, another reason you may want to do that. Uh, electronic challenges, timers are a challenge, altimeters are bulky, and there's sometimes uh, reliability issues with the G switch, the, the G switches and, and the altimeters built in there. Um, and so maybe you want some uh, high power redundancy, RC could provide that. Mercury switches are famously, uh, <laughs> People get really nervous about using those uh, at the World Championship. It always rains on scale day because they use a lot of mercury switches and they're very unreliable. Uh, if you ask them, well, why don't you just test it? Well, they're too unreliable to test with a real rocket. Um, so there's safety issues. If you jostle it, it could, it could, it could go. You know, there's all sorts of problems with mercury switches. And then, so why not use, why hasn't RC used in the past? Well, 72 megahertz has been traditionally the technology for RC, and it has all sorts of problems. Um, if somebody's flying an airplane in the next field over, it could trigger your ejection charge or ignition, because if you're on the same channel, it talks to each other, and there's all sorts of other problems. The antennas are really long. Um, so, next next slide, please. So, 2.4 megahertz, or gigahertz is the, is, is the uh, current technology, and it's changed everything. Uh, there's There's been a swell in those who fly RC airplanes, because it's been, it's affordable, it's safe, improving, you don't have to impound if you're flying. And by the way, at rocket industry events, there's generally not impound. And so it's really dangerous to fly 72 a lot because there's no procedure to safely use 72 megahertz. 2.4 gigahertz, you can have literally 100 uh, transmitters in the room at once uh, and all flying different things at the same time and they will not crosstalk. Uh, the technology has gotten to the, to the point, uh, I won't get into how that, how that works, but they, they lock in one radio to one receiver and nothing else can, can interfere with that. Uh, it's highly flexible, there's all sorts of things you can do with it. Uh, it's very lightweight. Um, it's, it's also, uh, you can use it uh, as, as low as 3.5 uh, volts. So the voltage requirements to use these systems are, have become extremely low, which adds potential to using more power. Uh, they can be really small. I'll show you how small in a bit. 
Um, and you can do telemetry and, and, and other cool things with them uh, that I don't have time to go into right now. There are some challenges. The, the, the wavelength of uh, 2.4 gigahertz acts more like light than sound. 72 megahertz uh, acts more like sound, so it'll penetrate through things. So you do have to be careful about what materials you use around the antenna with 2.4 gigahertz. In particular, avoid uh, metals and avoid, um, avoid carbon fiber right near the antenna. Um, uh, fiberglass and, uh, and other uh, compounds are generally fine. Next. So, I first wanted to go see what are the guys who did use 72 back in, you know, tradition, how did they work their systems? And I just wanted to mimic that. What, how did that work? Uh, then I wanted to see if I could uh, go all electronic, because I knew, I knew normally they use mechanical methods of triggering. Then I wanted to see if I could, I could use alternative systems, because none of those would work in low power. They're just too bulky, too much stuff. Um, and I, so I wanted to see how, how, if I could use an alternative method other than mechanical or switch, and then see if I can miniaturize that. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, first, very, very important to test these systems. Each time you build, you configure it, whether it's a different receiver, whether it's a different uh, uh, battery voltage, whether it's a, it's a different, um, you know, whatever you're using, a, a different material, if you're using a different rocket, make sure you test it. Um, and, and it gets expensive to test, you know, a dozen igniters. Uh, so I would test three or four, uh, and then you can use an alternative method of testing using a buzzer or a light, um, which would save, save me a lot of money, because I literally wanted to test 50 times. Um, and then each configuration must be tested, as, as I mentioned, and then you must test the range carefully. Staging, less critical, because it's going to be low to the ground. But for ejection charge, these are mission critical items. You must test, you must test, you must test. And, 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 and range testing in particular is important because these receivers have different range depending on what you pick and their orientation is important too. So you want to mimic the orientation of the antenna to the, to the radio and you want to mimic the materials. Uh, you, could, you could put it in a, in a payload bay to launch it, that's a really good but it will be an expensive way to test. Uh, you could put the, 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 the transmitter or receiver uh, on something and have somebody watch it while you walk away and have them see if it's, if, if it's working and, and test the range that way. You can get some ground interference. I wanted something where I could test a whole bunch of times and that would mimic real life rocketry conditions. So I came up with this method. Okay, so um, thank you Alyssa for the fine artwork. Um, <laughs> And so what I had her do was fly the radian and watch for a, the light, okay? And then I drove the truck down the road, stopping every 200 feet, and then until I got to 1,200 feet, that's as far as I wanted to test this particular system, uh, but I could have kept going. Uh, and then seeing, as she was up three or 400 feet, she had, she had a uh, altimeter on there so she could measure how far, and I was able to test the range. Um, you know, so that was actually a pretty uh, inexpensive way to test you know, the, the airplane gear is a hundred bucks. Uh, you need, do need two people, one of which must be an RC pilot. Okay. Two minutes? Okay, I keep going. Okay, mechanical way, the, le the lever works. Uh, next one. Okay, uh, this is a Pico switch you can, you can use uh, to uh, electronically mimic the mechanical way. I wanted to make it much smaller, so I discovered that you could use the electronic speed controller normally used to drive the motor would deliver voltage. Uh, well, it failed at first, but I realized that you needed to have a brush system rather than brushless. So make sure if you do this, get a brush ESC. Go to the next one. Um, we don't need to play this. Go to the next one. So this right here is an ESC, electronics. You can see how small it is. Uh, and I'll show you the first system here. It's quite bulky. The second system here is um, a little bit smaller because you're going to all the electronics. Now the third system, if you could, you can skip that too. Um, I, I, I use the, uh, this is the video, you can skip this. Okay, the third system is, is right here. Uh, back up one, please. And this uses an, an ESC. This is 30 amps. This would fire multiple igniters at once in midair, but you've got a pretty big battery there, so this would be a, a bigger rocket. Now, how small can you make this? I'll show you how small. That fits in a BT-20. Now, will it fire? Go to the next one. It did not fire an Estes igniter. Now, this is not a research and development a report on igniters, um, but I know a Q2G2 from Quest is, is a much lower current. Go to the next one. So I switched that out. 
and go to the next one. Play that video. Oh, play, this is how I tested it with the light. You can play that hover, Ow. hover, hover over it. Then click. Okay. Oh, there it goes. There we go. You got it. Got it. Right there. Click, please. Tap. Yep. All right, tap. Didn't do anything. Okay. Try to push down. There we go. Okay, nice and bright. We go to the next one. Now, can this little teeny system fire this igniter? You can play this video, please. And it did. Uh, so I think this is a, a potential game changer for rocketry when you can ignite something this uh, in a BT-20. This changes everything, I think. You can control uh, altitude, ignition, use motors that are designed for RC and traditional, um, and you can also do a lot of other cool things. So um, I, during Q&A, I will pass around this system. This is a tiny one. Yep. And my formal presentation is over, but um, I'll also give the judges, oh, safety, please. Um, whatever tr trigger you have, uh, uh, make sure you protect it. In this case, I have tape and an elastic band to, uh, to, to hold that down. So there's the rating. Okay, Q&A, please. Uh, how high would you trust being able to um, ignite something or do an ejection with the system? Well, um, um, it all depends on the system. The small one, uh, I wanted to test up to 1,200 feet. I wouldn't, I, I would get a little nervous beyond that. But here's the cool thing, 2.4, you can use all sorts of multiple antennas. You can actually use household 2.4 gig, uh, gigahertz uh, uh, extenders. You can use directional antennas. You, high power, you can go all the way up. But the, the, the higher the range, the more power you'll need and the more equipment. And you may even get into FCC, you may need an FCC license to get to a certain um, uh, wattage. Yeah. How hard would it be for someone to, I don't know, take your R&D recorders and plans and build one of these for their own rocket? Uh, it's plug and play. Um, if I could have the, the system, oh, um, if I could, if I could borrow this just for one second, sir. Um, this battery is two dollars. This receiver was six fifty. This uh, little teeny ESC was seven and a half dollars. Wow! I'm holding in my hand less than twenty dollars. Plug and play. Well, I did have to. You did have to do. Uh, I did a little soldering on, on the battery connector. I did do a little soldering. But it's two wires. And you have to have the transmitter. But the transmitters can be purchased for as low as 30 bucks now. It, this is an incredibly, this is a game changer. This is an incredibly cheap system. And if tested properly, very safe. I wasn't sure from your report, but uh, the Pico switch thing was uh, that's a step along the way to the ESC. This was a step. I was trying to mimic. I wanted, first wanted to. I wanted to know. I knew what worked in the past. So we don't want that. Yeah, idea. yeah. Uh, it works, but I fried one of these because it, it was limited to five volts, and I put a two cell. Uh, Did you say battery. the ESC won't light LEDs? No, it it, it, it wouldn't. And I I'm not an electronic expert, so I just went to the good old incandescent flashlight bulb, and it worked. And every time that bulb worked. Um, I'm, I'm, we have a lot of scientists that know here. Uh, it would it would fire Q2G2, so it needed enough current just to, to light up. That was more than the igniter needed. Next, uh, you mentioned directional antenna. I think that's a good idea, uh, especially when I mean, you can make a gaggy for 2.4 gig, pretty small. Where where we're shooting, you know, Ryan could right. just, just aim it really carefully. Exactly. Ryan, you know, some of your report, polarization, if, if, you're, if you're vertically polarized and the rocket's horizontal, you fire an injection charge, because I'm going to assume you won't stick if it's off now when you're not right. in the Is that, in, in flight tests, is that a, is that a huge problem, or am I, am I making a big deal? It's, it's, it's a, no, you're not, making, you're not making too much a big deal. The question was um, antenna direction. This is critically important in 2.4 gigahertz. If you're flying around a park flyer airplane, um, just around your backyard, 
This little, this little guy is actually, well, you can see, it was reliable at 1,200 feet. And we circled it and circled it and circled it so that it had every single antenna orientation. The antenna for this technology is best uh, receives when it's sideways to uh, the, the transmitter. And the transmitter transmits most strongly when the antenna and the transmitter is sideways to the receiver. So sideways to sideways is strong. If you're pointing straight at each other, you'll get a very, very short range. So um, they have solved that for longer range applications by dual antennas. This little guy right here is $20. And it's a, it's a spectrum receiver. It's got a, uh, a one long antenna and one short. And so what you want to do, if you're using it in a rocket, cross it like this. So you have one, the short one, uh, horizontal. So if you want to trigger up, but well, let's say if it's at apogee and you're pushing the button and nothing's happening, well, that other antenna oriented uh, vertically will catch it. Either way, it's going to get the signal. But again, test, 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 test. This is not a technology that you just throw in a rocket and go. Okay, so Tom says we're out of time, so I'm sorry we have to move no. the next speaker. So let's thank you. Thank you very much.